Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to the desktop for another rules breakdown. And this week when I did my retro RPG on Wheel of Time, it's basically Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition, a D20 game. So there was no point in doing a rules breakdown because I've already covered D20 rules a couple of times. And I looked at my collection and I thought about doing Earth Dawn and realised I've got a bunch of source books to do and I tend to like doing a, a retro RPG and a rules breakdown on the same subject. So I'm kind of immersing myself in the game each week. I looked at Mutant Chronicles and realised I've got source books that I want to cover for that. I looked at all sorts of games and wanted to do them along with the source books. But then I spotted the Babylon Project here. And I've covered all the source books I've got for that. Plus, Wheel of Time RPG and the Babylon Project, both are co-written by Charles Ryan. So we've got a very oblique connection here between our My Retro RPG and the Rules Breakdown this week. But Babylon Project is by Chameleon Eclectic Games. There's been various Babylon 5 role-playing games since then, but this was the first back in the 90s. And I really like the way it set up the world. It was an interesting game, especially as it came out while the series was on. So it was providing background information on the world of Babylon 5 while we were still watching it. Now skills. If we look at the sample characters at the back here, we can see one of them is April Vincent Nebula, who is a computer analyst. So for example, Nebula is trying to hack into a computer. Well, she has the hacking speciality here. Well, that gives her a plus two to her skill. And her skill that it's based under is software des. So she already has four plus two. She's up to six. And hacking is probably an intelligence-based task, although you could pick any of the stats, but intelligence is most likely for hacking. So she's got six in that. So that's her up to a 12. Now, looking at the difficulties of tasks, if we put them turn to page 90... We can see here that Trivial Tasks are target number 2, Easier 3, Basic 5, Average 7, Tricky 9, Difficult 11. And you might think that she can perform all tasks up to 11 easily because she's got a skill of 12 and she would only need to roll for Very Difficult at 15, Next to Impossible at 17 or Miraculous at 25. But that's not quite how the system works. You see, you modify your dice roll by ro or you modify your skill by rolling two dice. Now, one of the dice is good. They recommend using green for that. One of the dice is bad. They recommend red for that. But it can be any colours. You're just rolling two dice, but you need to know which is which. Which is good, which is bad. And you roll them, and whichever is lower modifies the dice. So the green dice is lower than the five, so her dice roll is modified up by two. Whereas if she'd rolled a six then her dice roll or her skill would be modified down by five because the red would be a lower score. But she got a two, so she got a 14, which means she can't do very difficult tasks, but she can perform difficult, tricky, average, and below. Now, the level of success is task resolution interpretation. She rolled the fa If she failed the roll by six or more, she'd have a critical failure. So she might not only fail to hack the system and alert people that she was there, she might delete the data she was there for the first place. Roll for, by four or five, a significant failure. So she sets off alarms. Guards are going to come a-running. Roll fail by two or three, a normal failure. She failed to hack the system. Roll fail by one, a marginal failure. Or perhaps she got some of the data she was looking for, as she gets some kind of clue. But she fails to get what she wanted. Um, roll made by zero or one, a marginal success. Well, she managed to succeed. But there's some kind of flaw to it. The data will disappear. There's some kind of timing on it. Uh, two or three, a normal success. She succeeded normally. Significant success and critical success. So she gets the data and she gets any bonus information the Games Master might want to give her. Now, initiative is a predetermined stat. If we go to the character sheet, we can see initiative here is 
Agility plus wits divided by two. So if we go back to the character, her wits is five, her agility is five, 10 divided by two is five. So she has an initiative of five. However, that might be modified by equipment. So if I turn to page, I believe it's 165. We can see armor here. So if she's wearing an armored jacket, her initiative is modified minus two. She goes in three. Wearing a riot jacket, minus one. Royal Guardsman combat jacket, minus two. Um, Talak military gear, minus one. And those armors reduce the initiative, slowing you down. And initiative basically just runs from high to low. So you've got your predetermined amount. You modify it down by armor, and then you go in order from high to low. In matter of ties, player characters go before NPCs, and player characters can just make a decision who goes first. Now, in combat, it works basically the same way, whether you're in melee combat or if you're in range combat. The difference is your target number. Now, as with other skills, you're taking your combat ranged or your combat unarmed and you're adding it to your agility. So Nebula here only has one in ranged combat, one in unarmed combat, agility of five, so she has a six. Now if she was attempting to attack Alec here in hand-to-hand -hand combat, now if he's not attempting to fight back, she'd surprised him or whatever. She'd be going against his straight agility. So she'd be trying to get a six. She'd roll her dice. The two is lower. So her skill is modified from six down to four. So she fails her attack. If she'd rolled a four on there and got three higher, she'd have succeeded. She'd have passed his agility. However, if he's fighting back, then he'll be rolling his unarmed combat back. And Alec has a four and a six. So rolling... 10, he'll make his dice roll, and whoever gets the higher wins that attack. He can then counterattack and fight back automatically, and she can parry or attempt to parry if she wants. However, in ranged combat, if we turn back to the combat section, your target number is based on the range. So with a pistol, it's basic up to 5 meters, average 6 to 10, tricky for 11 to 25, very difficult 25, 26 to 50. So let's say you're firing a, a handgun at something 11 meters away, it's tricky. We go back to the target numbers. Page 90, there we are. So tricky, you would need a nine. So once you've determined with, that you're shooting, you can also modify it by shooting at somewhere. You see, Babylon 5 uses these hit charts. And most attacks are at the default aim point. So you're hitting somebody in the center of mass. Now. Depending on if you want to hit them somewhere vital, you can increase your target number by the number of hexes you move. So if you're trying to shoot somebody's gun out of their hand, it's two hexes away, so your target number's increased. There's still no guarantee of knocking the gun out of their hand, but you have at least hit their hand. Or if you want to shoot somebody in the head, that's two hexes away as well. So your target number is, uh, your skill is reduced by two levels. Also, when you make your roll, your hit might deviate. So if you make a critical success, then you hit right where you targeted, and you get plus two to your damage. If you made a significant success, then you hit where you aimed for. Normal success, you're going to move one hex out in a random direction, rolling a d6. So we rolled a three, so you move one hex down there, 
So you'd be hitting him in the armpit. Or if you're trying to shoot in the head, you'd be shooting in the shoulder. And if you got a marginal success, it'd be two hexes out. So there's a good chance you'd be completely missing unless you're going really for the core of the body. And you could wing them. So once you've hit a target, you flip to page 165 to see what damage you're doing from the weapon. So a standard pistol is doing 14 points of damage. Some do 13. You've got heavier ones which do 17 damage. For melee weapons, they do strength plus a damage bonus. So Nibula here has a strength of 3. So her using a small knife gets a plus 1. So she does 4 damage. However, Alex here has a strength of 6. So he'd be doing 7 damage. Now what that actually means is on the immediate effects table. So we're back to page 108, I think. Yep, 108. So her punch doing 6 damage. If she hit him in the armpit, so in the torso. Would have a not effect of stun. And zero points of um, impairment. Whereas his damage of seven, if he hit in the same place, would have a minus two chance of stun and a two points of impairment. So two points off all her skill uh, rolls because she's been wounded. Now, as you receive more stuns, the numbers add together and you have to make repeated rolls to stay conscious. Once you're down, um, to keep from being knocked out by a blow, a player must roll a random number equal to higher than the stun number. If he or she fails the roll, the character is stunned. A stunned character cannot act the next round, and each round after that, the only action they may attempt is to recover by succeeding an average difficulty task roll, based only on the character's endurance attribute. So, you receive a head wound with target of 6, you make an endurance roll, so 4 there. We roll the dice, the 2 is lower, so it's only a 2, so she would be knocked unconscious. However, if she'd rolled a 5 and a 6 and taken that up to a 10, she should have resisted the uh, wound. But these add together as you receive multiple wounds and you can become stunned. And of course, bearing in mind that you've got your immediate effects, penalties to your dice roll. So you'll be finding it tougher and tougher to resist damage until you are taken down unconscious or killed outright. Now, damage done in combat doesn't really carry on over. You see, you then go to wounds and injuries final effects because you don't have any health system. Now, you add up the total damage the person had received to what location, and then you look up the bleeding level. So, receiving... 12 points of damage in the head means you've got 60 minutes to get medical aid or you bleed to death. And if you receive treatment, you will survive. You also then work out the type of damage and what your final impairment is. Because the impairments you receive during the combat, you shrug off, but you get a final impairment later, which comes off your dice rolls going onwards until you're given time to heal. Advancement is on page 117, so you gain experience points in the standard fashion. Turning up to a game session gives you one, the Games Master can award once for good role playing and coming up with good ideas and good planning. Spending them costs differing amounts, so attributes cost 7 experience points per level to increase, and skills cost 4 points per uh, level to increase. You may also gain new specialities in a skill by spending 4 experience points. So, we flick to Nebula here. Now, she can increase her strength from 3 to 4 by spending 7 points. She can also increase her intelligence from 6 to 7 by spending those same 7 points. She can increase her unarmed combat from 1 to 2 by spending 4 points. But she can also increase her software deaths from 4 to 5 by spending 4 points. Or she gain a speciality, which gives a plus 2 bonus. 
under any of those by spending four points. Now that is a brief rundown of the Babylon Project. Now, it includes some of the hit location ideas out of Millennium's End, although they are streamlined somewhat, but it's still quite a clunky, air complex combat system where you don't have hit points, you're doing damage, which increases the difficulty of the damaged person doing tasks and gives them a chance of falling unconscious. It's a little weird, it's a little different, but I can see how it would work in play. But, as usual, I've probably gone on for way too long. So thank you very, very much for watching. Please like, subscribe and comment below, as it does me massive favours with the YouTube algorithm. And if I haven't explained things particularly well, please ask below and I can clarify things. But, as always, most of all, you look after yourselves and I'll catch you later. Bye now.